Tonight, Muncie opens up uh, our novel. They're all watching. Wow. Hashem. So, we'll say hello, Muncie. Okay, now Nancy the Great will recite her poem. Thank you. Don't get too emotional on me tonight. I won't. Hello, Muncie. Good evening, everybody. Um, today's poem is dedicated to all the children and to my child. It's called Why Hashem Loves His Children. The children sang praises to Hashem. Their sweet voices were heard in heaven. They, untouched by worldliness, were completely innocent in their prayers. Hashem opened his loving arms to them, for they were truthful and without guile. Yes, God embraces the little ones, even as they are the positive mirror of the good in mankind, the blessed collateral for the giving of the Torah. Is it coming along? Okay, um, I'm going to do the Rufu Shalemas um, after the Shia when I go meet the Shem Tadam Mayrib. I'm going to take them with me because it's very, very late. Um, so I will take it all with me and I will mention every single name, Bezrat Hashem. In Shul, by the Arna Kodesh, and Amit Hashem will have a full shalom. It's just a little late to, um, to start reading all the names. So let's switch it up a little bit. Um, we'd like to welcome Dove. How are you, Dove, in the back um, from England? You should, have, you should have introduced me with an English accent. It would just like, would have gone over better in Muncie, maybe. Anyway, thank you for coming, Dove. And there's a lot of things going on in Ornava. A lot of things going on in Ornava. So, Avivit's not here because she's working on the Shabbaton, which I'm sure all of you are coming. Um, so, she gave me a couple of things to announce. First of all, is he here? Yeah, so he, he's in the back. Oh, he's in the back. We don't want him to blush. Um, our cameraman and um, the, the only um, guy that I ever let into Arnava every single Wednesday night, because he's my Talmud and I'm very close and he's, he's a very, very special boy. Baruch Hashem, last night he got engaged. Jake. <laughs> Hiding behind wherever he is. Mazel tov, mazel tov. It wasn't to, it was, it wasn't to an Ornava girl. Go figure that out. But um, Baruch Hashem, he gets a mazel tov. And um, may he have many, many simchas, many, many simchas in his life. I actually just came from, just interesting, I just came from a reunion of my class in Crown Heights Yeshiva, wow, uh, 26 years ago. And I met all my boys that were in my class. So um, it, was, it, was, it was absolutely amazing to see them. And um, I still have to say, and I told it to them, that, and they're all in different walks of life, whatever. Some are, Rab some are Rabbeim, some are not, um, by a long shot. But... Um, <laughs> I said that with all that I do and all the places I speak and everything that I do in Ornava, which I love very much, and Benochai and Ateras Nava, there's just a certain connection between a Rebbe or a Mora or a teacher and, the, and they're, oh, where you've been? It's been a very long time. Everybody's back tonight. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. The original Rivka. The original Rivka. She brings me, she's bringing me water for how many years? Seven years? Six Seven years? years? Seven years. We missed you. So thank you for coming back. All right. Anyway, I could just say that there's just something about something being in a classroom. She's Basia. She drew the water. Right. So now what she drew, she drew the water. It's a Rifka, Basia. It's all, it's all working out. Right. Right. Mitzashem. Mitzashem. And right up. You gave a wedding gown to a wedding? We have a wedding. 
Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Anava is doing all kinds of good stuff. First of all, last week I spoke about helping me raise money, and um, I have to tell you that that um, through through Anava dot com and through the mail and whatever this past week just from speaking and people sending one dollar and whoever you add out there that sent me one dollar I appreciate it because that's a dollar that we didn't have beforehand some people sent five some people sent eighteen some people which was really good decided to join monthly they gave a credit card and said just hit my credit card for ten bucks or eighteen dollars I'm, I'm not even know that much of a difference and um, Lamaisa at the end of a week it's a week later it's close to three thousand dollars that um, that we raised between five dollars and ten dollars and eighteen dollars, and if that continues, uh, times by times that by fifty, and um, at least we'll be able to pay for the southern fried chicken. No, it's uh, a lot of money. So, so we want to thank everyone very much. We're sort of running this little contest. We made three thousand last week. This week we'll try to make five thousand. That's all up to everyone that's watching. Um, we don't want to have to go out and ask and beg for money. It's much easier this way, and um, then I can hang out in New York. I don't have to fly all over the world. Okay. Um, Shabbaton. So there's really, really, we're not playing games. You know, eh, make believe, so it's sold out. There's really very few rooms left because we didn't get the whole hotel. So we lost, because we got the hotel a little bit late, so we lost like 50 rooms. So we don't have that many rooms. And it's really first come, first serve. And uh, I don't know that we have that much room left. So whoever wants to be by the Shabbaton, if you don't want to be by the Shabbaton, you need to go to therapy. There's something wrong with you. Um, I, want to, I want to tell you how many shiurim there are from Friday at 12 o'clock to Sunday at 12 o'clock. Okay, you ready? There is 8, 16, 24, that's just a breakout sessions. 25, 26, 27, I would say probably about 35 shirim um, from Friday afternoon. Now, you don't have to go to all those shirim, those are all breakout. What we did is we didn't want to have one shear. we wanted to have eight shirim at a time. So every single girl or woman, depending on what she's interested in, when those shirim go on, have a shear to go to. So we have our whole staff there. We have eight shirim at a time. We have shit catering. We have pomegranate doing a crazy kiddush. Um, so we have an unbelievable Matzah Shabbos planned. The whole Shabbos is just going to be, it's Erev Purim. It's right before Purim. It's Tim Chazecher Amalek, which every woman has to hear, Deor Aisa. Um, it's Shabbos Pasha Zachar. It's like... Why wouldn't you be there? So some girl said, money. What's money? <laughs> so, you, you know, pay it out, whatever it is. We, we, really, want, we really want our, our Nava girls there. There are girls coming from California flying in. There are girls coming from Montreal. There's a few cars coming from Detroit, from Muncie, from all over the place. But La Maisa, the core, 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 is, 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 this, is this room. And... Uh, and therefore, we'd really like everybody to come there. We're very, very excited. I'm davening and davening and davening that it shouldn't snow. Um, I'm also davening that Sunday morning at 6.34, it should be clear sky. Because in Mitzvah Hashem, whoever can handle it, we are going to be on the beach in Mitzvah Hashem for sunrise. And Ray Walsh is going to be giving a shear at sunrise. And then maybe we'll daven, we'll seek in, whatever. It's going to be something really special. So we're hoping that it won't be cloudy. So you can either stay up till sunrise or you can wake up for sunrise. And um, you have my word that we need there. I won't be late. Because if I'm late, I miss sunrise. And you'll all be out there like, where is he? Right? So look at it this way. If I don't get up for sunrise, we'll wait till sunset. <laughs> okay? We'll be up for sunset. So Mir Tashem, first year at the ocean at sunrise. See what happens. It's going to be amazing. So we really want you all to come. Um, there's really not that much room left. I don't want to say no to girls, that's for sure. Okay, now, we're doing something else. We did this many years ago. There's a whole story that's brought down about a girl, two, two different girls. One couldn't find a shidduch, and one could not have children. 
And in each story of these two, of these two they found out when they went to the Makubal of the Tzaddik, the first thing he asked the parents of this girl that couldn't find a Shidduch, did you make a Kiddush when she was born? Did you have a Karsatot when she was born? Did you make a Kiddush? And they found out, no, they were busy about mitzvah, this and that. They never made a Kiddush. He said, go to Shul, make a Kiddush, give her name at the Sefer Torah, make a Kiddush, and you'll see. And in both cases, it worked. So there are many girls that either they were born to non-religious parents or it just didn't happen, and they were never named at a Sefer Torah. They don't even have a Hebrew name. Or some girls, for whatever reason, there was never a Kiddush made for them when they were born. So three, four years ago, we did a mass, a mass Kiddush. All these girls came to shul. And mass naming at Sefer Torah. And I think there was 100 or 200 names. And it was very nice. We did it by Rabbi Weinfeld. So we decided that since Pomegranate is giving this major Kiddush, that we're going to give that Kiddush after, after laning, whoever does not have a Hebrew name, whoever does not have a Hebrew name, or was not named, um, Hashem, we will, at the laning, at the reading of the Torah, we will name them. And the Kiddush will be in their honor so that they have a name, and they have a Kiddush, and Emitz Hashem, then they'll have their mazel, and they'll get whatever they need. It's a crazy Shabbaton. It's totally out of hand. The Shabbaton is totally out of hand. Okay. Um, Rabbi, what? When is going to be programmed on the internet? Program? Uh, you want to know what the program is going to be? When you get there, you find we'll give you a program. Uh, maybe they put it up already. I don't like sending anyone to the internet. So if Chatz Shalom, you're on the internet, then that's where you should go, or Nava.com, or Torah anytime. But I don't, I don't like to send anyone to the internet. Okay, because I'm old-fashioned. I'm a dinosaur. Dinosaur? Okay. Rabbi Freeman is collecting Matanas Lev Yonim. Any girl, you have to give Matanas Lev Yonim, give the money to Rabbi Freeman. You could also give it to us to give to Rabbi Freeman. He's also inviting, he's, he's a big tzaddik, He's also inviting everyone to his shul, this place, for Su'uda, 5.15 p.m. on Purim Day. Free. I like that word. So there's a phone number called 718-648-4865. We'll, we'll give it out in the back. Anyone who needs that, who needs that number. Rafu Shalem, it's Rabbi Belsky. Shalom ben Chanet Cyril, big gadol, who's, who's not well. And um, that's it. So let's give a share. We're here for a shir. Let's give a shir. So anyway, next week, wow. Next week, Shabbos. We're looking, really looking forward to it. Okay. Mr. Hashem, Hashem will give us good weather. They said, the girl said, we'll take care of everything. And we'll all see you got a daven for the weather. So, <laughs> we'll daven. We'll see what happens. All right, this week's Pashas. Excellent. Pashas Truma. This week is Pashas Truma. It's good you're all into it. You heard all the ladies in Muncie. They all screamed Pasha. I just heard it. All screen Pasha's Truma and St. Louis, and I can't forget Dallas. They get very upset when I forget them. And uh, London, no. London's like 4 o'clock in the morning. I don't think they're up. Um, if you're up in London, what? Kansas, St. Louis, Chicago, Cleveland, Muncie, Lakewood, Passaic, Toronto, Montreal. I know one bus load for sure is coming from Montreal to Chapton. Those girls are traveling seven hours to come to our Chapton. And you have to travel 45 minutes. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Anyway. Okay, it could be because in Montreal they have no, there's no life. Okay, whatever. Anyway. So, hi. What? Toronto's coming also? Yeah. I think they're flying though. All right. So let's talk about Pasha's Truma. Very important Pasha. Very deep share tonight for a change. So it says like this. Vaidaba Hashem and Moshe Leim. Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, Dabe El Bnei Yisrael. Speak to B'nai Yisrael, V'yikchuli truma. Take for me truma. We'll give you the art scroll. Take for me a portion. What truma means, you know, something that a person gives up, a tzedakah, a charity. Take for me a truma. May ace kol ish, ashe yidven alibo, from any man, from any person, that his heart, right, motivates him, that, that he wants to give. Take from someone that wants to give. Tikhu es trumasi, take my truma. Question number one. It, you just said in the beginning of the Pasuk, talk to the Israel, truma, take from me truma. Then you say, take from every person who wants to give truma, trumasi, take my truma. Why are you repeating it? You said it already. You said v'yichali truma. So why does the Torah repeat twice, take from me truma? You already said, 
take from them truma from each person that wants to give truma. So why is it why is it repetitive? That's question number one. Question number two. So the pasuk continues and it says, "This is the truma that you should take. You should take gold and silver and copper. You should take blue wool and purple wool and red wool and linen and goat skin and red skin and and there was a there was an animal in those days a fur that was multicolored and oil and spices and um, the two stones that were on the shoulders, the Avnei Shoham, the Avnei Malu, and the stones that were in the Choshen. And then the Pasik says, Ba'asuli Migdash, make for me a, a temple, B'Shachanti B'Socham, and I will dwell in you. So there's two questions on this. So we're going to have three questions all together, and then we're going to answer them all with one answer. Ba'asuli Migdash, you should build for me a temple, B'Shachanti B'Socham. And and so that I can dwell in you. It should not say b'socham. It should say b'shochanti b'socho. Build me a house and I will dwell in the house. Not build me a house and I will dwell in you. That doesn't make any sense. So the Torah is telling us, v'asli megdash, make me a base on megdash, b'shochanti b'socham, and I will dwell in you. It should say, b'shochanti b'socho, make me a megdash and I will dwell in it. So what's this word, b'shochanti b'socham? Question number two. Question number three. The Torah starts off and tells, we'd like everyone to come and, uh, and, and give a donation, and we'd like you to give gold and purple wool and all these different things, right? Why? So the Pasuk ends and tells you, for us to Migdash, make for me a base on Migdash, for and, and I'll dwell in it. If, if, if I walk over to someone that I know, I'm like, listen, get me an electrician. So he's figuring my light bulbs went out, and a, and, and a heat guy and a masonry, and a plumber, and a painter, and the floor guy. He's like, what's going on, right? What do you need all these people for? So if I'm building a house, the first thing I say is, I would like to build a house. Now, this is what I need to build the house. I need a plumber, electrician, this, that, the other thing. Gold, so, so Hashem should have, it, the Torah should have started off like this. First Pasuk, Vaydab Hashem Moshe Lema, Hashem said to Moshe saying, Vaasuli Migdash, make me a base on Migdash, right? Vashachati Besocha, and I'm going to dwell in it. How are we going to do that? Dab Ben Yisrael, talk to the Jews, Vayichalut Trima, tell them I need to give donations from every single person, and it should be Gold, silver, copper, wool. You don't first say, tell them I want gold, silver, copper, this, that, the other thing, and give all the ingredients, and then say, build me a base on Megdash. It should have said, build me a house, and for the house, this is what I need. Not, this is what I need, and by the way, it's for a house. So it's totally not in the, wrong, in the right order. So we have three questions here. One, why does it say, Tichu with Trumasi twice? Two, why does it say, I want you should dwell in you? Three, it should start off the, the parsha with, I want to build a base on Migdash, I want to dwell in it. Please tell people to give what they need to give. I think that this parsha and this, these few psukim are the essence of the Torah. In fact, Truma is in Perich of Hay. And also in Perik Chavav, Chavav equals 26, which is, of course, the Gematria of Hashem's name. Truma is a very, very important Pasha, and I want to tell you why. And I think that it's a secret that, that of what it means to be a Jew. Hashem said the following. Dabel B'nai Yisrael, tell every single Jew. V'yichali Truma. I want something from all of you. <clears throat> Take from me something. There's something that I want from you. Now listen to how we're going to change the words. I shall you dvena libo tichu es trumasi. The truma, the donation that I want from all of you, is your heart. Totally different. In the beginning, the pasuk tells, tell the menei to bring me truma. But what is that truma? The second part of the pasuk explains what is that truma. What is that truma that I want? I want gold. I want silver. I want words. What do I want from you? 
How do you build a base hamigdash within yourself? For shachanti b'socham, says Hashem. I don't want to live in a bunch of bricks, in a bunch of gold, in a bunch of walls. That's not where I want to live. I want to live in you. So you can build a mishkan because it's something you can see. But at the end of the day, where do I want to dwell? So come amongst you, in you. That's what I encourage people. How does God dwell in a person? So the Pasik tells you. Tell them that you have to take it. I need a part of all their hearts. They need to give up a part of their heart. That's how a person builds a Mishkan within themselves. What, what am I talking about? So the, the answer is as follows. The heart of a person, the lave of a person, represents a person's lusts, his taiva, the worldly thing that he wants. That's why in Shema we say, before Einechem, you would think, I see it, I'm hungry. I see the chocolate. Now my heart wants the chocolate. Right? I see the bad thing. Now I want the bad thing. So in Kriya Shema, it should say, don't follow your eyes. Because first comes into your eyes, then it comes into your heart. No, says in the No, if your heart's in the right place, your eyes, you won't look at what you're not supposed to. Just the opposite. If you're controlling your heart's desires, then you won't look at the things you're not supposed to. It doesn't start with your eyes, and it doesn't start with your ears. Starts with your heart. So Hashem said something here which is so essential to every single person who wants to create a Migdash within themselves, a temple for God to rest within their souls. Yidveno Libo, you got to give something up. You got to give something up. A part of your heart, a part of your materialistic, your lust your tithers, your stuff. You've got to give up something of your stuff. Now, in the truma of building the Mishkan, there are 13 items. There's gold, there's silver, there's copper, there's blue wool, there's red wool, there's purple wool. There's a lot of different items, and Kabbalistically, each item, gold stands for gaiva, silver, each item is a midah, and it's, it's very, very involved. We're not, we're not going to go into that tonight. But there are 13 different things that make a Mishkan. There are many things that we do. You want that God should dwell within you? So many of us feel like we're disconnected. I talk to him. He doesn't talk back. I don't feel him. I don't see him. I'm totally disconnected. You know why? Because he's not, he's not living within you. Because there's no room in your house for him. Because if the warehouse is full, you can't put the new stuff in. You've got to take some of the old stuff out. So... You got to give up one thing. That's how it starts. You got to give up one of those things in your heart that's taking up bad space. And if you give up that one thing, but it's we, it's the div libo. It's something that you're not doing it because of me. You're doing it because of you. It happened. You know. It's funny that that every time I give a shear on that day, something happens that has to do with my share. Today in my high school, I was in my high school, and this girl is not, there's a girl that came after the summer that said to me, Rabbi Wallace, I just want you to know that I kept three Shabbos. See, we don't, we sort of put everything on the table like a smorgasbord, and we want the girls to own their decision. In other words, don't do it for me. Do it because it's something that you feel is the right thing. So we try to explain to you what the right thing is, and then you want to do it. Because if you're doing it for me, the minute I'm not around, the minute I'm, not, I'm not watching you, you're going to do what you're not supposed to. But when you make a decision, and I can tell you this from my life experience, when you make a decision, we call it, you own it. When you own that decision, nobody, nobody can change you. Nobody can change you. If you're making such, because your parents told you, your Rebbe told you, this one told you, and that one told you, then... It's not yours. It's not your decision. They made the decision for you. So if it's not yours, 
Somebody else can come along and change that decision. Because it's not yours anyway. So they just switched. This wasn't mine. This isn't mine. So you have kids that do things because they were told to do it, and then they meet a friend who tells them, ah, this stuff is stupid. This doesn't make any sense. Why are you doing it? And all of a sudden they switched. What happened? Because they never owned that decision. And the chinuch, really, what we should, the way we should teach our kids is, is to show them the beauty of Yiddishkeit. So it's something I want to do. You forced me to keep Shabbos and you're not watching. Uh-huh. If I want to keep Shabbos, it's a decision that I made. Forget about it. It's an exercise. It's in the physical world. If you exercise you're, because someone's making you exercise, you'll find a different excuse you know, every day not to. If you, if you made that decision because you want to exercise because it's important to you to be healthy, then it doesn't matter if the world's caving and you're like, I'll be out in an hour and a half, world, because I'm exercising. You own that decision. There's no... But when the doctor tells you to do it, you're doing it for the doctor, and I'm doing it for my wife, and I'm doing it, doing it for everybody else. I start, all these guys who start, who start smoking, the reason they start smoking is because they don't own the decision. They did it for somebody else. My father, Oliver Shalom, stopped smoking when he was like 32 years old. He used to smoke two and a half, three packs a day. And he tried everything to stop, and he could not stop. And then one day he went to the doctor, and the doctor put up his lungs, on the, the, the x-ray of his lungs, on the light board, and there were no lungs. Because the black on the side of the x-ray and the black of his lungs were exactly the same. So you couldn't see his lungs. It was so, it was so black. So the doctor said, you're not going to live much longer. you got three little kids. My father said he took his pack of cigarettes, he ripped them in half, and he threw them in the garbage never to smoke a cigarette again. He never picked up a cigarette again. His whole life. He paid a price. He had esophageal cancer. He paid a price for the first 32 years that he smoked. There's a price. You think you can stop, you know, you know when that gene turn, when that, that, that cell changes, you can't say I'll smoke for five years and then I'll stop. But he always said that, I pay, I'm, you know, I, I pay, I'm paying a price for my youth. But Lamaisa, he made that decision. There was no way that he was going to start smoking again. But I have friends that stopped because their wife said stop, go on the porch, it's and that. And this one said stop. They never made the decision. They never owned the decision. So it's not in the div lave. It's not something you did it on your own. It doesn't last. So today, 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 a girl came over to me. She's in our school three months, four months. And she says to me, well, Wallace, I want you to know that over the weekend, I made a decision. I'm like, yeah? She goes, only skirts. That's it. I'm not wearing pants anymore. And she wasn't there for two years or three years. I said, why? She said, it's just... Just a decision I decided to make. I said, who told you to do it? She says, nobody. I said, you know what? You will never wear a pair of pants again. Because you made that decision. You own it. So the Torah is telling us over here, if you want to build a mishkan, you want to make a place that you want, you want to be connected to God, you want to feel Him, you want to bring Him inside yourself, you have to own a space in your own, in your own heart. You need to own it. It needs to belong to you. And the way that it belongs to you, it's interesting, the only thing that you own is what you give away. That's, that's the whole thing in, in, in tzedakah. All the money you own is not yours. You could die in a second, it's not yours. Whatever you gave away in tzedakah, that belongs to you. The exact opposite of the physical world. Physical world, whatever I give away, I, I don't have anymore. Tzedakah in the spiritual world, whatever I give away, that's all I have. I gave away a little personality, I made somebody smile, I gave somebody my time, so that time I have in the next world. The other time that I that was in this world, once I'm dead, I, I don't have that time anymore. It's gone. But the time that you spent with your parents, and you did give it of aim, that time is in the next world. What you give away in the spiritual world is what belongs to you. What you give away in the physical world is what belongs to them. The exact opposite. Mm-hmm. So the Torah is telling us, if you want to build a Mishkan, you've got to give something the div libo, it's got to come from your heart. You have to want to do it. You have to make a change. And then slowly but surely, you give the gold. And then you give the silver. And then you give the copper. And then you give the blue wool and the purple wool and the red wool. And before you know it, all of a sudden, you're a walking mishkan. You're a walking person that Akash Baruch Hu wants to be with you all the time. I, and I can tell it to you in my own life. First thing I gave up was very hard. It was very hard to give up movies and 
I spoke about this in Manchester, they don't let me back anymore because you're not allowed to tell anybody that you went to movies, but a long time ago, a long time ago, I went to movies. It was, it was so long ago, they were silent. It was silent movies. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. No, the people in the, in the theater were silent. But anyway, um, so I remember when I made that decision, I made that decision. Nobody told me that I can't go to movies. Because I went to science fiction, I made that decision. I just looked at myself one day and said, you're a Rebbe, 15 years. You're going into class. Okay, the kids aren't from, so like, they all go to movies, right? You're not going, but I said, it's just not right. You're a Rebbe, a Rebbe can't go to movies. And I stopped, and it was very hard for me because I like, you know, I'm, I'm out of the box, and I love science fiction, and, and I love to watch a movie and say, that's how you made the movie, I could have made it much better, you know? <laughs> So, so it was very hard for me. But I took that spot in my, in my heart that had the word movies on it where God will not dwell. He will not dwell where it says movies. He will not dwell where it says internet. He will not dwell where it says Facebook. He will not dwell where it says Goyish music. He will not dwell where it says provocative. He will not dwell in any of those places. So my heart was full of all these different things. So I said, you know what? I'm going to make a little room for him. And I'm not going to go to movies anymore. And it was tough, and my friends made it very hard on me. They didn't make it easy on me, because if I don't go, then they have to look in the mirror and figure out why they don't go. So they invited me more and more and more, but I didn't go. And then one day I said to myself, how did you do that? You stopped going to movies on your own? So maybe you could give up television. So I got to come home, I got to wind down. What am I watching already? Seinfeld, Kramer, he's a Jew. Seinfeld's a Jew, Kramer's a Jew. What's the name? Wants to become a Jew. The writers are Jews, right? So it's like, you know. I said, but you, you, you gave the gold. You were Nadiv Lev. You, you gave to the Mishkan the gold. Now let's give the silver. Because the Mishkan is made out of many parts. Let, let's give up TV. How am I going to do that? I'm like, look at the strength you had to give up the movies. Use the same strength to give up the TV. <coughs> Buy some books before you go to sleep. Read about Rapan, read about something else. All of a sudden, I haven't looked at a TV. I haven't seen a TV in 15 years. All of a sudden, it's 15 years. I was a kid that, as growing up, I used to fall asleep watching television. And I said, wow. So now already, my Mishkan's beginning to build. I, I, got, I got rid of the, the gold. I gave the gold. I gave the silver. And then came the next thing, my, my science fiction books that I wasted a whole Shabbos reading, all the new trilogies and buying them the minute they came out and wasting my time in all these books with goblins and orcs and like, what are you reading about goblins and orcs? Like, you know, but I loved it. This was my, whole, this was my world. And then they came out with, uh, with what's-his-name, of course, after I stopped reading books, you know, uh, Harry Potter. So that was great, you know, he could, why couldn't they write that when I was growing up, but okay. So there I was on a plane with seven Harry Potter movies. Just push the button, all seven of them. And I'm, on a, I'm, I'm flying from London to Miami. It's 12 hours. 12 hours on that plane. And all you need is to push the button. I have Harry Potter, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm sitting there, Hashem. I'm not on the earth, really. So, like, it doesn't really count when in a, I'm in a plane. It's not like, you know, I'm like in Shemayim over here. Like, you know, and it's Harry Potter. And, I, and then the last one is two parts. And it's like, oh. <laughs> I already gave it to Hashem, I can't. That that's space is his, I can't bring Harry in there. <laughs> can't, can't bring Harry into the Kodesh Kedoshim. You're not allowed to bring a Zohar into the Kodesh Kedoshim. Harry can't go, Harry can't go into the Beit HaMikdash. He said, hey Harry, Potter baby, no can do. There's no room for you there. It was tough, I'm telling you, it was very tough. The Pringles I gave into, but the Harry Potter, <laughs> that was... So I, I was like, wow, you know, where did that, that strength come from? The strength came from because Hashem is already living in my soul. So he's already in there. So he's already giving me strength. They're making a little bit more room. And then e each thing I gave up, each thing I gave up, it was a struggle, but because you gave up something else, and it was all, nothing was forced. Not a thing. It was all the div libo. And one by one, each thing, and then of course the hardest thing of course was music, um, was non-Jewish music. And I'm still paying a price for it. Honestly, I'm still paying a price for it. Because had I never listened to Goyesha music, because I'm a drummer, had I never listened to Led Zeppelin, all this stuff, then I would appreciate Jewish music much more. 
but because I lived in that world and I listened to rock and roll, which nothing compared to what they're listening to today, right? As, because I, therefore, you walk through a fish store, and you know what? Even if you don't buy fish, you smell from fish. At the end of the day, I can't appreciate, you know, the slow, very deep songs that are on because to me, I need a beat. I, you know, I need that beat. I need that that boom, 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 and I'm not getting that from from the Vegas. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, Shweki just came out with a magnificent song, a magnix a video, a magnificent song. Everybody's talking about it. So, so today, what? Crying Cry some. Cry no more, right, whatever. So you can't wait this amazing song. Everybody's talking about it. I love Shrek. He has the best voice in the whole world. So today in my office, they said, you got to hear this song. And they put it on. It didn't do anything for me. Because it wasn't... Because that's what, my, what I got used to. So it's already 15 years that I haven't listened to a, a rock and roll song. And I'm still paying the price because I can't enjoy what I really should enjoy. There's a consequence to everything. But Bar Hashem... I was able to, to give the nechoshes, to give that part of my, of my, of my lave to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And, you know, a girl in seminary said to me, like, Ray Wilson, you really have no life. No television, no movies, no books, right? No Gaisha music, like, like, what are you doing in this world? Like, you really have no life. And I'm like, I'm a lot happier than you are. And I sure have a lot more time than you do because you're on your phone and in your music, and you have these guys screaming in your ear all kinds of terrible things. You're walking around with all this buzz in your ear. I don't have it. I have time to learn. I have time to do things. It was like, how, how do you have so much time to do all this? It's because I don't have internet. I don't have Facebook. I don't have a Blackberry. I don't have Goyish music. I don't have magazines. I don't have newspapers. I have life. I'm connected. Mm, I'm I'm 54 years old, and my base of Middash is not finished. There's only a couple of pieces in that, that of this. That, that, but we're building. We're building, and it's all in the Divli, but I own it. I own Harry Potter, man. I sat on there for 12 hours, and I knew that all I needed to do was push a button. It was free. And I had all the excuses. I give, just gave three days, 23 shirim. I mean, come on. want to watch Harry Potter, please. I mean, come on. Who's it going to hurt? But it was my decision 15 years ago not to watch movies. Therefore, I own it. I own Harry Potter. He doesn't own me. I own my phone. My phone don't own me. I don't want to answer it. I'm not going to answer it. I don't want to look at it. I'm not going to look at it. I don't want to look at it for an hour after I wake up in the morning. I'm not because I own my phone. My phone doesn't own me. But most of us, that phone owns you. That's the godness of this Pasuk. Because Baruch was saying... <laughs> Tichu is chumasi has to be nadiv libay. It has to be something that you're giving up on your own. Not because Walston gave a speech or Olaska gave a speech or your teacher gave a speech. It's because I want Hashem to live in me. I want to be connected. I want to be his base. You know what he's saying to us? He's saying, I am willing to move into you. And you're saying, sorry, no room. We're booked. I got Facebook. I got movies. I got this and I got that and I got this and I am too busy and there's just no room for you in me. Well, nebuch on all of you. And that's why everyone's depressed. Everyone's down. Everyone's disconnected. Will is doing drugs. It's crazy what's going on. And they don't realize the whole thing is that they're disconnected. Hamakosh Baruch Hu, they're totally disconnected. One of the greatest moments of connection to Hashem was by Kriyas Yamsa. And there's an unbelievable medrash. And the medrash says that every Jew did not know what the other Jew was going to sing. It says, Az Moshe, Uvenei Yisrael. They didn't, it wasn't like he led us, us, your share, your share. That's not what happened, the Medrash says. Every single Jew sang the same Shira from within, not knowing what the other one was going to sing. How could that be? And the answer is because they all got connected to Hashem. So it's all the same song. 
It's all the same song. And that song doesn't exist in this world anymore. Because nobody's connected to Hashem. So the songs that exist in this world today are sad, angry, disgusting, immoral songs. Because there's no connection. So the world, if you look at the world, the world's not happier. All the, another state decided to vote to give equal rights for men getting married to men. Right? The funny word that they use, gay. Gay means happy. Yeah. Right? Nobody's happy. You think, gay, you're all getting your way. It's a liberal America. It's a liberal world. This world today should be much happier than the world was 300 years ago. Because you can do whatever you want. Right? We should be much happier. You can get any fruit, any vegetable. You got, you got Skype. Right? You can see somebody across the world. You got, what don't you have? It gets hot, you turn on the air conditioning. It gets cold, right? You turn on the heat. What don't we have? You need a drink? It's cold. Whatever you want. We, there's, we should be, there should be no Prozac, right? There should be, there should be no medicines for depression. It should not exist in the world. We, the whole world should be on a high. Do you understand? We can do it. Get a car. You used to get on a horse in the old days. You used to get on a horse. And you have to put his horseshoes on. Could you imagine any girls in this room and a smelly horse to come to share? Right? And you gotta park him outside, you gotta clean up his mess. Ugh. And they're full of flies. Every once in a while they hit you with the tail. Come on. Right? What a life. Ice, snow, freezing, freezing in the summer, burning hot, no way to get cool. I remember Khatasi in the old old three stooges. Terrible television. Three Stooges. Very violent. <laughs> There's also three Jewish guys, so, you know, it wasn't so bad. So, when I was a kid growing up, so they had this show, I guess, when they first started in Wardville, where they had an, what's called an ice box. We have refrigerators. They had an ice box. It wasn't an ice box. You had this box. And then these guys would sell ice. So they put this big hook, and they would carry this huge chunk of ice all the way up to your house, stick it into that big box, and that's how you kept things cold. You didn't plug something in. And then it melted, right? And then you had to order ice again. Now, before there was ice, there was nothing. There was no such thing as a cold drink. Could you imagine that? Just water if you happen to live next to a stream. Everything was lukewarm. Ooh. Right? So we have everything. You get into a car. You get into a plane. You're in Israel. Nine hours. You used to take three weeks on a boat, throwing up over the side, Going up, going down, squashed, disgusting. And you sit on a plane today, and the Gansa plane is fetching. Where's my food? This wasn't my seat. The steward is there. Everyone's fetching. The bathroom's making too much noise. The toilet doesn't flush. What's going on? Where's my special kosher? Where's my special... Oh, sure. Oh, sure. When they, were, when they came out of the Holocaust, they had special kosher on the boats coming to America. My <laughs> grandmother told me. All the people from the Holocaust, they were complaining. They didn't have their special kosher. I'm kidding. <laughs> if you're on a plane, you get on, you get off, nine and a half hours, everybody's kitchening. Standing by the, where's my, where, where's my suitcase? Why do I have to wait? You got, you got a Kennedy Airport, ten and a half hours later, you're in a taxi on your way to Yerushalayim, you're complaining, your luggage took an extra eight minutes. It used to take them from New York to Israel three weeks to get there. Three weeks on a boat, in the ocean, <laughs> barfing your brains out. <laughs> and now, it takes you nine out, and nobody's happy. Nobody's happy. We have everything. The liberals have all their rights. Everybody can do pretty much whatever you want. You walk into a room, you flip on a light, everything is automatic, computers. You don't even have to know how to, you don't even have to, know how to spell. In fact, my little, kid, my little grandson came home with spell words. I'm like, why? When he grows up, it's going to be a computer. It's going to do a spell check. Why do you need to know anything? Right? It's going to do everything for him. What are you wasting his time for? So we have everything. So how come we're not happy, everybody? How come nobody's happy? And the answer is that the Shekhanti Besochem, inside, we have nothing. Outside, we have everything. We got planes. We got money, food, refrigerator, whatever you want. Whatever you want. You got whatever you want. Whatever you want, you got. But inside, you got nothing. And if God doesn't dwell inside, 
you don't have anything. You don't have happiness. But you've got to give him room. And if it's full of everything else, there's no room. And that's what this Pasek tells us. This Pasek tells us, I just want one thing from you. Just want part of your heart. Just give up something. Something in that heart that's not letting me in. Just give up one little thing. I'm not telling you. I, it took me years to give up all those things. And I'm still working on myself. And you're never a finished product. You're never a finished product. I, I, I was telling it to... Who did I give a shit to this week? I don't even remember anymore. I was telling that, that a few years ago, it was very, my most, one of my most embarrassing moments was that this girl came over to me after the year. She was 19, 20. She's not here tonight, so I could say the story. She walked up to me, and she was very disgusted. She's dating for like two years, which is not the end of the world, it's not, or whatever. But I think she like dated 40 guys. So we're all they're all nuts. One's crazier than the next. I can't find a normal guy. I'm like, come on. She says, no, you don't understand. I don't know who the, what, who's ready me to shidduchim, but it's like, it's not normal. It's not normal. This guy didn't walk me to the door. This guy didn't open my door. This guy is like, you figure out where we should go. She's like, he's the guy. He's the man, like, right? So I gave a whole shit to my boys last night. I was yelling at them. This whole business, and I can't change anything. I was in L.A., and the girls are like, we have to fly to New York for shidduchim. Then I was in uh, Toronto, and the girls said, we have to fly to, we have to, fly to go for shidduchim. So last night after my shear, there was a boy in my shear who I never saw before who was going out with this girl, and he's coming from Montreal. No, he's coming from California. Coming from California. So he flew in, and he did that, you know, five days, and he went out five times with her in five days, which isn't so good when you keep going out with somebody, but they like each other. So now it's her turn. She has to fly to L.A. for five days. I'm like, it's good you're not in my shear because you wouldn't come back here next week. What are you talking about? I'm like girl is chasing you? She's flying to L.A.? What kind of man are you? You're a man? Get out of a plane! You're taking out a girl? And take her out! She has to sit on a plane with a bunch of goyim by herself, fly to L.A. where she knows nobody, because what? Because you flew here? It's like, you do this, I do this? It's going to be a perfect marriage. I'm like, where's the man? What happened to the man? He says, that's the way they do it today. Girls have to fly from Toronto, they have to fly here, and then they go out with the guy and they're like, what? What I get dressed up, what I have to fly? I don't know when it changed, I, but the bottom line is that Shachan, I'm telling you, Wallstein, this is the way it is. If, if they want to get married, this is what a girl has to do. Ugh. I'm saying it publicly. Ugh. <laughs> and that's why men have no respect for their wives anymore, because if that's how you brought up, that your wife, that this girl, has to fly for eight hours to come date you. Why should you respect someone like that? So that, that, that we're creating our own monsters. I don't know. It says in the Torah. I, I believe in the Torah. I don't know where, where all this, uh, this stuff, this new religion came from. It says in the Torah that a man, Azav, Azav of Emo, he leaves his mother and his father, and he goes, he goes out and he gets a woman. It doesn't say anywhere there that a woman leaves her mother and her father, and goes and gets a man. Now that's in Bereshis, and that's in my Torah. I don't know Shatchanim, resumes, all this other baloney, and all this other garbage. It's, it's not what the Torah says a person should do. But if you don't do it, at Wallstein, she's not going to get a shidduch. And if she does do it, what kind of shidduch is she going to get? She chased him. She had to drive to Baltimore. One girl told me, she drove to Baltimore. She gets to Baltimore, because he's in Baltimore. He's learning. Tyra, right? So she has to drive to Baltimore because she has no life. She drove, she drove to Baltimore the day, and he said, since you brought your car anyway, so let's go with your car. So on the day, not only did she drive to Baltimore, but she drove him on the date. <laughs> so I said to her, and how did, it, how did it go? She said, he's a pretty nice guy. I said, he's a nice guy? You drove six hours, you're dead tired out of your brains, and because you came anyway, so I might as well drive another four hours, I drive around, and take me out. I said, where's this marriage going? Like, where's the respect going? Where's this, what, what's happening over here? Where are the men? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. But my, my, my Talmudim, no way. You dare make a girl drive from Baltimore to take you, or somewhere to come take you out. 
I don't, I don't know where I, don't, I have no idea. I don't know where, I don't know what's going on. Like the whole world just like everyone's doing their own thing. I, I have this. This is my book. This is my manual. The manual says the guy goes gets the girl, not the girl has to drive six hours, get on a plane, pack, sit with a bunch of schmunzes over there, squished in. You go! I told him. I told him last night. I said, "You like her? You like her? Go back to L.A. Do what you got to do. Book yourself a ticket and come back when you, in two weeks. Why does she have to fly to you? Well, I flew to her. What is this? Anyway, I'm just, I'm just, this just happened. This just happened. This happened last night. So, why am I telling you this? Because a person, a man, a person, whoever it is. You have, to, you have to be a mensch, number one. The number one thing is you have to be a mensch. And to be a mensch, you have to be a nadiv libo. You have to be willing to give up the me. That's the only way Kish Baruch wants to have anything to do with you. For us, the only way you can do that is you have to be a nadiv libo. You have to be willing to give up something of your own. You got to do the traveling. You got to give up something or else it's not real. And that answers the other two questions. Why it says V'shechanti B'socham instead of V'shechanti B'socho because Hashem says, I don't want to live in a, in a bunch of bricks. I don't want to live in a bunch of bricks. I want to live in you. There's a lot of shuls out there in, in Europe that are hanging out there that are empty. There are shuls up in the mountains that I drive by that have been closed for 20 years. It's a bunch of bricks. Hashem doesn't want to live in a bunch of bricks. He wants to live in each one of us. We got to make room, girls. We've got to remove one little piece, which will leave room for the next little piece. And then maybe you'll have some time to see what's going on in this world and to see who you are. This is where I tell you a short story about, a, uh, about an Adiv Libo. So again, that girl today, very, very impressive. She's in school for six months. She made that decision. I was like, wow. And I know I don't have to ever ask her again because it was her decision. She owns it. She mamish owns that decision. She will always wear skirts. Because from what she learned, she made the decision, not because we made her do it. Of course, in school you have to wear a uniform, but outside of school, we don't make anyone do anything. We want, we want to teach you the Torah, we want to teach you the right way, so that you come to the conclusion to do the right thing. You still have to do the right thing. Even if you didn't come to the conclusion, you're not allowed to walk out not sneeistic. At the end of the day, you got to be sneeistic. But if it's, if it's your decision, because you come to the understanding that it's the right thing, nobody can touch it. So there's a story. I think this is the ultimate story of Nadiv Libo. And it's this week's Pasha. And I've said it before, but it's like, it's like the most beautiful story. And it's a story that happened in the times of the Arizal, and it's a story that happened with the Lechem HaPanim. Now the Lechem HaPanim was bread that was made in the base of Migdash, and it lasted from one Friday to the next Friday, it stayed warm, stayed fresh, which is like the same miracle that happened by Sari Imenu. And it was called Lechem HaPanam, the bread of the face, because of its shape. It was shaped in that way. So, there was this town, this, this, this is a true story, the, it's brought down in the Kisve Arizal. And, um, maybe it was in Eretz Yisrael, maybe it was in Tzfas even. So the Rav got up, and he was talking, this week's Pasha, Pasha's Truma. And he was talking about Lechem HaPanam, and that they had this bread in the base of Dutch and it was on the shulchan. And there's this guy sitting in the back, and he's like a total Amaretz. He's like a peasant. He never learned a word in his life. And he hears this. And he goes home, and he says to his wife, you're not going to believe what the rabbi said tonight. The rabbi said that God, in the t- when they had the temple, used to eat bread. They used to make bread, put it on a table for God. She's like, well, who's doing that for him now? And he's like, nobody. Maybe we should do it. So, it's a true story. They went ahead, they were poor people. And the next week, Thursday night, him and his wife baked 12, like Lechem upon him, 12 challahs for Hashem. You could imagine how excited they were. Nobody knows our secret. Nobody in the world is doing it. We are baking challah for God. So, he goes ahead, and Friday morning, very early, he takes the 12 challahs, and he puts them in a bag. Now, how do you give challahs to God? So he goes into the shul, and he opens up the Aron HaKodesh, and he takes these warm challahs, and he puts them next to the Sefer Torah, and he closes it. And he goes home, and he tells his wife, 
I gave the challah to Hashem. They're not so sure. A million percent if God eats challah or he's going to like their challah. Maybe God likes whole wheat. He likes black and white. You know, we don't know what he likes. So, right before Shabbos, when everyone's getting ready for Shabbos, he sneaks back into Shul and he opens Aron HaKodesh and it's gone. And he runs home and he says, he ate it! There's nothing left! He even ate the bag. Right? He ate everything. There's nothing left. This went on for a year. Every Thursday night. Nancy, I'll tell you the end of the story. I'll call you. Thank you. You got it. Every single Thursday night, these two were dancing. They were feeding Hashem and nobody in the world knew their secret. They were so excited. Then one Shabbos, the man came right before Shabbos when he used to check to make sure that Hashem ate the chalas. And he put his head into the Arna Kodesh to look. And just then the rabbi walked in. And the rabbi saw somebody in the Arna Kodesh. He thought he was stealing the Torah. What are you doing before Shabbos? And said, so he ran up, right? And then when he saw who it was, he said, what are you doing? You're trying to steal the Sefer Torah? Why, why, why are you in the Arna Kodesh? And he said, Rabbi, I'm going to tell you something that you can't tell anybody. It's a secret. And I said, okay, what's your secret? He says, you remember a year ago you got up, Hashish Truma, and you're talking about the 12 breads that were in the base Hamigdash that were on the table? He goes, yeah, the Lechem upon him. He says, I went home and I told my wife and we said, nobody does that for Hashem anymore. And since that speech, every Thursday night, me and her, we stay up all night and we bake beautiful, warm challahs for Hashem and we put it here and every single week he eats it. And the rabbi says, Aha! So it's you. You're the ones that are putting these challahs in the Arna Kodesh. He says, that's right. He says, well, every Friday morning, the Gabbai would come the whole place would smell from chawah. He opened up the Arna Kodesh and he saw 12 chawahs. We thought some rich guy wanted to give the poor people chawahs without anyone knowing, Matam Besaser. So we took those chawahs and we gave it out for Shabbos to the poor people. He says, oh no, Ramai. You gave Hashem's chawahs away. I can't believe it. And the rabbi says, you fool! You think God eats chalas? God doesn't eat chalas. The lechem upon him that was in the base Hamigdash on Friday, the Kohanim ate the chalas. God doesn't eat chalas, you fool! He was totally, the true story, it's written in Kisve Arizal. He was totally broken. He came home. That Friday, he told his wife, you know what? We're both fools. God doesn't eat challah. So she said, so then, so then what happened to the challahs every Friday? He said, the Gabai, the Shamis, he just gave it out to the poor people. And the two of them just sat there and cried. They can imagine, they thought they were feeding God and... Okay. Friday night, after davening, there's a knock on the door in the rabbi's house. The Arizal is there. The Ari HaKadosh. He says to the rabbi, come out of the house, I have to talk to you. He says, yeah. He says, so, during davening, Chodaydi, Arizal was able to like meditate, whatever it is, and to go to Shemayim, to see Shabbos. It says, he was able to actually to see the Shabbos Akala. He said, so tonight by davening, the Shechina was talking to me. And the Shechina said, who stopped the poor people from making me my chalas? This is what, this is what the Arizal wrote. HaKosh Baruch Hu said that from the time of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash till this couple, he had no enjoyment from this world. This couple the quote, brought back the reach nichoach, 
the spiritual smell that I used to have in my Beis Hamikdash. Who stopped it? Tell the Rav he will not live out Shabbos. Now Rizal said, you stopped it. Tell your family to prepare. You will not make it through Shabbos. But Kachayat says, that night, the Rav died. Now, let's look at this story. What? what? They were baking challah for God? Come on. It's blasphemy. God doesn't eat. But they gave him their heart. Kol Nadiv Lev. They gave Hashem. The physical thing they did was very foolish. God doesn't eat bread. But when they sat there and they baked it, they did it with their full heart. I am making challah for Hashem. Hashem said, that I never had since the Mishkan, since the base Hamigdash, since I asked for Kol Nadiv Lev. I finally got it back and now somebody took it away from me. You hear the power of giving God something from your heart that's real? Even if it doesn't make a difference, if it makes a difference to him, it doesn't make a difference to him, that I watch Harry Potter, I don't watch Harry Potter, I don't know. I don't know how much of a difference. But it came from my heart. It, I did it for the right reasons. Whether that's the end of the world or not the end of the world, you could say, Rabbi, it would be more important if you grew a beard or if you did something else than not watching Harry Potter, whatever it is. It's not important. It's not important. It came from the heart. That's what Hashem wants. He wants something from your heart. And if you give one piece, because the base of Migdash, the Mishkan was built, one guy gave the purple wool, one guy gave the gold wool, and each guy pointed and said, you see that purple wool? That string is for me. It was, it was all of it put together. So if one girl gives up movies, and one girl gives up rock and roll, and one girl gives up talking to boys, and one woman gets dressed sneers, more sneers, and one girl is more honorable, does give it a aim better, and one woman is nicer to her husband, and one man starts to wear tzitzes, and another man starts to wear tefillin, and another man starts to daven with kavana. These are all those 13, all those parts. And when you take all those parts and you put them together, then you made a base on Megdash. For Shulchanti B'Socham. That makes the Beis HaMikdash. All the parts. And therefore, that's the answer to my last question. The parts come before the Ba'asa Lili Meidash for Shulchanti B'Socham. Not, I want to make a Beis HaMikdash, give me the parts. The parts. This girl gave up this, and this girl gave up this, and this woman gave up this, and this guy gave up this, and this guy gave up this. At the end of all that, what did the Pasuk say? <laughs> you made me a Beis HaMikdash, now I can dwell in you. Not, I want a Beis HaMikdash, give up this, give up that, give up this, do this, do that, change that. No. That doesn't build the Beis HaMikdash. Just not a Nadiv Libo. I'm forcing you, and it says that Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu had Ruch HaKodesh, and when a person came because he wanted Kavod, or he gave gold because his wife told him to, or it was peer pressure, he said, take it home. I'm not taking it. There wasn't one part of the Mishkan that wasn't there because a the person wanted to give it on their own. So therefore, the Pasuk is the opposite way. The Pasuk says, this one gave this because he loves Hashem. This one gave this because he loves Hashem. At the end, gold doesn't, make a, gold doesn't build a house. And purple wool definitely doesn't build a house. And, and blue wool definitely doesn't build a house. And doesn't, and doesn't build a menorah. And all, right? All these little pieces, they themselves don't build a house. Pipes don't build a house. Electrical wires don't build a house. You take all these parts and you bring them together, says Hashem. Then what do you have? You don't have gold, silver, and copper. You have a megdash. And that every single person in this room watching, every Jew, has the power to do. You've got to start with giving up one little thing because you want to. And then we'll have this chosim et Hashem to see the real base of Megdash from Harry Amenu. Amen. See you at the Shabbat home.